we used to do. It. Thank you, Sandy. I appreciate it. And do uh, so. Uh, we're in the book of Devarim. Uh, it's the last uh, portion of, uh, of the last book of the Torah. And um, I don't know. I get I get mixed emotions reading this. I almost feel as if um, I almost feel a little melancholy when I read it because I realize it's Moses' last instructions to. Uh, hold on one second. My wife just found two beautiful menorahs at Goodwill of all places with two Israeli coins in it inside inside the shadow box. Let me see. Yes, with two Israeli coins, antique coins. It's probably worth a lot of money. Wow, it's pretty. I'll just hope she buys it. Anyway, let's get right into Devarim. Now, we're going to do... Uh, uh, just an overview, and then we're going to get into the text. Obviously, the Parsha, Devarim, means words. Um, it's found in Deuteronomy, the fourth, I mean, the first chapter. It's going to run through the third chapter. Um, 37 days before Moses passed, and he begins this repetition of the Torah, and he assembles the children of Israel together, reviewing the events that occurred and the laws that were given in the course of the 40-year journey in Egypt, uh, out of Egypt into Sinai in the Promised Land, and, you know, rebuking the people for their failings and inadequacies and enjoining them to keep the Torah and observe its commandments in the land of God. He's, he's, he's got them at the edge, and he knows he's got to give them this last push or boost up and that they have an eternal heritage in the Torah, and that when they cross over after his death, they will begin to, to live in the land. I, I little did they know how much how difficult it would be to stay in the land if you don't do the things of God. Now, Moses recalls the appointment of the judges and magistrates. We're going to read through that to ease his burden burden. Uh, uh, I think it's Rambam. Ramban has uh, a commentary on that saying that judgment is for God alone. Then why did God give judgment to the judges? Why did he allow the judges? If God deserves and God is the only one who judges man, then why did he choose to do it this way? Well, this is the whole part of, this is the whole part of Torah itself. The giving of Torah in the world gave the uh the task of the Jewish people to be the uh preserver and harbinger of the word of God, the Torah to the world, not only to them, but to the world itself. And that they were put in the place to use that Torah to bring uh, rulings and judgments uh, for the Jewish people. Now, this judgment thing was not always a negative thing. I don't, don't take the word judgment as a negative thing. These judges were appointed to, to meet out exactly what the Torah says. And it's an incredible thing. Hold on, I have to sneeze. I'll let it Bless cut out. You. Later on. Okay. Bless. So uh give thank you very much. Um so the Torah would be um uh, sort of presented to the people and the judges would help uh, decrease the level of work that Moses had to do his job. So he would teach the judges, he would teach the elders, the leaders, and they would teach the people. Moses, uh, in the latter part of this text, recounts uh, some more recent events, the refusal of the nations of Moab and Ammon to allow the Israelites to pass through their countries, and the wars against the Amorite kings took place, and um, it was a tough. It was a tough time. Then we is a discussion of the the successor Joshua, who is given the baton, uh, the the leadership of the people of Israel, and this last phrase I want to repeat. He says, "Fear them not." Talking about the battles of conquest when they were getting ready to fight, he says, "God shall fight for you." So once again, the people of God show their 
their, what do you call it, their dedication to preserve the Torah and to live in the land according to the laws of Moses, and at the same time, uh, rid the land of its idolatry. They had a big job ahead of them. We're going to start in the first verse of Deuteronomy. Let me pull my text up. Deuteronomy chapter one. These are the Moses, the words of Moses addressed to all of Israel on the other side of the Jordan through the wilderness in the Araba near Suf between Paran, Tophel, Laban, and Hazaroth, and the Zahab in the 11th day from Horeb to Karnash Barnea. In by the mount or by Mount Seir in route in that direction. It was in the 40th year on the first day of the 11th month that Moses addressed the Israelites in according, accordance with the instruction that Hashem had given for them. After they had defeated Sion, king of the Amorites, who dwelt in Heshbon and king of Abishan, who dwelt in Atzeroth. And on the other side of Jordan, the land of Moab, Moses undertook to expound his teaching. And these are the words that he said. Our God spoke to us at Horeb, saying, you have strayed, uh, stayed here long enough. It almost reminds me of kicking a teenager out of the house. <laughs> it's about time you've been, you leave. You, you've wandered around this place way too long. And they... Are, we are now getting ready to hear him recount the journeys through, throughout the wilderness. I'm not sure how to actually handle this because it's a review of, of uh, the places and the journeys and what took place and what happened. Uh, but we'll take our time to kind of go through, through the text itself. Uh, it says, start out and make your way to the hill country of Amorites, and to all their neighbors in Arava, in the hill country of uh, Shef Shephelah, the Negev, and the seacoast, the land of the Canaanites and the Lebanon, as far as the great river of uh, the great river, the river Euphrates. So we see that this is the whole region of Israel from the Mediterranean all the way over to the Euphrates. That is a massive land grab. Uh, it would take up much of uh, of the Middle East and that part of the Middle East. Uh, I know the Jews uh, are having to fight over a little speck, a postage stamp of land. Wait till the world realizes that their land is actually not just that size, but, but the size of, you know, almost the size of Saudi Arabia. It's like, uh, it's, it's going to be a mind blower. I don't know how God is going to fix that. I'm not sure how he's going to put it in place, but that's his problem because it is a big task that's got to be laid before uh, humanity. It says, I see a place, verse 8, he says, I see a place, I, I, I see, I place a land at your disposal. Now, there has been this discussion, you know, the, the Ten Commandments are going to be recited during Devarim again, and you look at the Ten Commandments and you you say Judaism has these Ten Commandments. We'll have 613, but the Ten Commandments given. And then we're told we the Jewish have people have free will. They can choose to do what you want. But these Ten Commandments were held over them. They didn't have a choice but to choose. But then they have free will. There's something here that says that the land is laid at your disposal. God gave Israel the land. And it was their job to possess it, to inherit it, to take care of it, uh, to grow into the land. And it says, thereupon, I said to you, I cannot bear the burden of you by myself. Now we're getting ready to get into the first elements that we read when Yithro shows up and, and Moses uh, is instructed and spoken to by his father-in-law about developing judges and this is where we're going to begin somebody will start reading after in verse 11 if you don't mind i'm gonna i'm gonna finish this verse here for god hashem has multiplied you into uh to this day as as numerous as the stars in the sky 
Now, I, I have, I've just been thinking about how the, uh, I've lost my map, but if you could picture uh, the Dead Sea and the uh, Galilee and the Jordan River, they're southeast of the Dead Sea at this time, and they're traveling north. They had traveled north up to uh, the Jordan uh, River between, uh, on the other side of the Galilee, and there they are preparing to cross over. They're sort of like in the Transjordan area, I guess, if you would call it that. Um, they grew. Now, how many people do we know was lost, do we think was lost in the wilderness? Do we know? It had to be hundreds of thousands of people. They were 2.5 million by the time they got to the Jordan. Think about that. They had just exploded. Now, the, these others, I don't know. Maybe somebody can take a look. Or while somebody else is reading, I'll take a look and see how many perished in the desert uh, to see how the community grew so big. Uh, who would like to take the next verses and read and provide some commentary? Can you not also think at this point in time, I love this first section because I was at Tel Tamar. Yeah. And Tel Tamar is right in the middle of all those four that are mentioned in verse number one. Mm -hmm. Is right in the middle. Technically, right there is a place called Avot. And we were, while we were there, Larry took me out into the wilderness and we saw the two roads, the one road that leads up to Jerusalem and the second road, which it leads over to the Mediterranean. This was a great traffic route of of goods passing through the nation it was right. in, inside israel one of the things that i always as a christian understood was that moses never got to go into the land well that's incorrect because he's already in the land right here he leaves right. this to go somewhere else but as you're going through down where beersheba is mm -hmm. goes south and a little bit to the uh west east of that and you will actually be well, just above the L in Israel is where a boat is. Mm -hmm. And that's the place where they camped. Um, tell Tamar that that's part of their dig is looking for remnants of the camp that was there because mm -hmm. it's all been over the top of each other. I, I don't think that they found all, they know exactly where all the camps were, do they? No, but I'm it's saying what they- yeah, what they're looking for is actually the remnants of the pottery and all of the vessels right. that were left behind. And that's what they were right. looking for. And they're down already uh, past the fifth level. So the sixth level is the level of Moses. That's where they're right. going. And if they can get that, they're going to go further down. They're going to go all the way down. And Abraham was there. So they're that's what they're looking so for. So their, their go goal is to get, get as deep as they can to find as much artifacts they can from that time. That's yeah. going to be interesting. Um, <laughs> go ahead. That's from that point on, if you go to the west of that, where it says Horeb, 11 days from Horeb, mm -hmm. actually Horeb is not east of where they were going, but it's actually west of where they're going because they'll go towards Horeb and then they'll go in and have a battle against the uh, Amalekites just north of that. Mm -hmm. uh, but Horb is where uh, Aaron was put. When I was there, Larry took me up on what we believe is Horb, and we found uh, artifacts which indicate that the Jews were on that mountain. Wow. And that's what I'm sa trying to say. But anyway, that's a very significant place. It's also the place where, in the end, where it talks about in the book of Isaiah that, that it will bloom like a, a rose actually right. it'll bloom like a water lily mm -hmm. because that place is full of water it right. doesn't appear to be but below the surface is a great deal of water right and so that's that's the place where they've used for many many years it's but it's actually the point at which the queen of sheba had gone through there solomon had been down there they put up a a uh, toll booth there Mm -hmm. it, it was a very significant place but as you're every, going every army in the region went through there as they were traveling to egypt absolutely or else. yeah that is the place that he stopped at so it's a very significant place and it's a, all the cultures have passed through that place and so right. they found artifacts from uh, everything uh, right. 
idolatry all the way through. So it's it's a very significant place. But I didn't mean to interrupt you. But that... no, 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 you didn't interrupt at all. It's what we we do. We jump in and add commentary. Who would who would like anybody have anything you want to contribute to this or an idea that you want to contribute so far? If not, who would like to read? Uh, Mike, go ahead. I, I like the the first word of the parsha are these, and it it separates the first four books compared to this book, and uh, these are the words of Moses. Means the words previously were Moses' words, but the words of God that came from Moses' mouth. I think this is uh, the rabbis say that uh, he he had uh, a speech impairment. And it gave even more force to the words he said, and they knew it had to be the words of God because it's his speech impediment. Right. But after this, he was healed, and his words became like a prophet. And he directed Deuteronomy in the way he thought he should be, and God gave his stamp of approval. Uh -huh. As you said before that, uh, could be in any kind of order. Yeah. But this uh, is in the order Moses deemed best, and God blessed it and said yes, and made it one of the uh, books of the Torah. So the question would be: Is what do you think, Mike? Is the reason why Moses did this? Why do Why do you think Moses did this? That you know to, to retell all this is not yeah. like the people didn't know what happened, right? Yeah. So they're very aware of their history. Why does he Why is he doing this? I have an idea. But I'd be interested to hear what you guys think. Well, the uh, Obarbanal says uh, that the Varim is neither a book of warning nor instructions, but to explain areas of doubt that was in people's minds or misunderstandings that people had. And right. So he's there to explain these things to them. Uh, we know that he went, he explained some things over again. He left some things out about the Cohen in particular. Then he added some things. Even though this was all given at, at Sinai, uh, he brought this out again. Um, I think maybe he knew that the people would uh, slide back, had the potential of sliding mm -hmm. back and forgetting. Mm -hmm. And he, like you said, it was his last 37 days. Uh -huh. And sometimes the last days of a person's life, they can say things that can be pretty potent as Jacob did. Yeah, yeah. And, and at the same time, he still maintained his level of kindness and humility in the way he approached it. He wasn't harsh on the people. Uh, he used um, locations to point out the the negative things that took place, so they can go, ah, yeah, this happened there. This happened there. I I, I see it also as the key that every human being, every human being, needs to put into practice in their life. And that is this, before you inherit exactly what God wants you to inherit in the sense that the treasures of wisdom, the things that God has for you in your life, it requires an intense introspection and inspection of your past and to know where you came from. Always remember what is what happened to you and how, what was your lessons learned. In the military and in business, they use a thing called an after-action review. When an incident takes place, they come out and they talk about what happened. I think they do it in the hospital uh, hospitals, et cetera. Uh, this was some sort of an after-action review by Moses and to give them some instructions and to also give an opportunity to possibly change their ways if they needed to before they go in the land. But I, I, I like what you brought about uh, the Arbanel. Anybody else? Uh, Rabbi? And I interrupt a little bit. Do you hear me clearly? Yes, sir. Uh, he says, Ele Advarim, this is a harsh word. Right. <laughs> this is not kind word, but harsh word. Oh, the words were harsh, absolutely. Harsh. <laughs> yeah. I mean, so harsh that uh, Rashi says that people thought that Moshe got out of his mind. Here he's talking to 600,000 at least soldiers ready to pass across the Jordan River, trained by Joshua, believing in God. This is not the same generation that came mm -hmm. out from Egypt. Now, most generals will stand up and say, in that moment, 
you are the salt of the earth. You cross, you cross and kill all the infidel. You, you saw in your Moses, the Jewish general, mm -hmm. stand up and say, listen, you are the scum of the earth. Huh. What do you think you are? I remember that you worship the God, the gold car. I remember uh, he may, all, all the names that he mentioned there. Right. Places where people messed up. Right. The complaint. So Rashi says, yeah. Rashi, I'm not quoting myself. It's Rashi in the middle. People thought it is this guy, 120 years old, has an Alzheimer. <laughs> so they come and, and ask him, what day is it? So I said, today is the 11th day of the month. Where are we now? He says, well, oh, we are the cross of John Lever. So he's in mind. So he's criticizing them. He mm -hmm. says, you, as opposite to all generally, all other nations, all other nations stand up saluting. You keep calling. You don't, leave, you don't stand in line. You, you, you still do misjustice. You still quote. So now, what's the point? Why I'm saying it? Because when 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 we following Moses, when we rebuke ourselves, when Jeremiah come and say, "Oh, you are the scum of the earth. You worship idol. I, I I hate you." So we Jeremiah criticizes Jewish people, Amos, Isaiah, whatever. I say criticize the Jewish people. That's fine. They follow Moses and they are right and we criticize ourselves. Mm -hmm. But what happened if, if non-Jews pick up the Torah, keep up the prophet, and say, oh, you are evil people. Even your own prophet mm -hmm. hate you. Who said that? That's the core of Islam. It is. If you read the Quran, only appear almost every other page. It is the Jews that the, the old prophet, the, the crook. I don't want to say anything about Christianity. You know the story. So we they replace. We are better than you. You are this. this we are trash. Right. Again. And, and it's no, no no wonder that in the seed of Moses appear the word Eicha, the destruction. So destruction of the Jewish people temples and the exile mm -hmm. and a thousand of years of theory of replacement of the Jewish people that black earth. Right. The Jews have been suffering from that for years because of this approach wrong approach, that even, even your own prophet, even Moses rebuke you. Who do you think you are? We are better than you. Okay, uh, that's it. I'm sorry, I had to shut the door. Go ahead. Go ahead, Rabbi. Uh, that's it, that's what I wanted to mention. Well, I, I appreciate you saying that. Uh, what what I was meaning by Moses' kindness is that he he remained uh, a humble, kind man, but it doesn't mean you're unkind to be harsh. If anything, he was being kind by being harsh. He's given them that fatherly instruction. I really appreciate you bringing that up from Rambam. And, and I, I agree with you, but no, the word varim, the Rashi build his studies. Harshness or Dvarim. Dvarim in rebuke. Right. So much that they thought he's crazy. Right. That's interesting. So they thought they had a job. Rashi said it. It's not me. <laughs> Rashi said they thought it is out of his mind. Yeah. That's interesting. That is interesting. Anybody want to add to that or we will go on or what? Okay. Mike, did you have something else you wanted to add to that? Because before, okay. So we're in verse 11. Who would like to start reading verse 11? Or verse 12, I'm sorry. Oh. 
Okay, I will. In verse 12? Yes. How can I carry by myself your contentiousness, your burdens, and your quarrels? Designate for yourselves men who are wise, understanding, and well-known to your tribes, and I shall appoint them as your leaders. You answered me, and you said, Good is the thing that you have proposed to do. So I took the leaders of your tribes, men who were wise and well-known, and I appointed them as leaders over you, leaders of thousands, leaders of hundreds, leaders of fifties, and leaders of tens, and officers for your tribes. I instructed your judges at that time, saying, Be attentive, attentive among your brethren, and judge righteously between a man and between his brother, and or even between his, his stranger. Do not show deference to individuals in judgment, equally to small as to great, shall you be attentive. Do not tremble before any man, for the judgment to God it is. The matter that is too difficult for you, you shall bring to me, and I shall hear it. I commanded you at that time all the things that you should do. We journeyed from Horeb, and we went through all the wilderness that is great and awesome, the one that you saw by way of the mountain of the Amorite, as he commanded Hashem our God to us, and we came until Kadesh Barnea. Barnea, Barnea. Then I said okay, let's, to you, let's Let's pause right there. I want to go back up to verse 12 that Sandy read. Um, how can I bear unaided the trouble the burden and the bickering that you people have done. <laughs> you could just hear like you have no idea how hard this has been to take down the words of the Torah and to disseminate it, to look at all the mysteries, the secrets and teach them and to deal with all of the rebellion and the bickering and the complaining. It's too much. And I had to do something about it. What does he do? He actually develops us what he called a what's the word for it? a civil government a government of judges of law enforcers etc and he gets these tribal men it says it experienced men appointed them heads over you chiefs of thousands chiefs of hundreds chiefs so we see a very close organization of um, hierarchy of command this sounds like a military uh, description with its uh, with its people. Uh, verse seventeen. This is the one quote that I was I was given uh, from Ramban. It says for the judgment is God's. The meaning thereof is expressed in the verse for you shall judge uh, for ye judge not for man but for the eternal and he is with you and is giving you judgment meaning to say it is for god to execute justice between his creatures for he created them with the intention that th there be fairness and justice among them and to deliver him that is robbed out of the hand of the oppressor and he des designated you that is the judges in his stead, and if you will be afraid and act un, uh, act if you will be afraid and act corruptly, you have sinned against the eternal, and you shall have betrayed his mission. They were given the job to judge, and they were also told that if they misjudge, they're going to pay the, a big price for it. Who else? Anybody want have anything you want to throw in? There is something in this that every time we come to this, it it puzzles me, bothers me a little bit, and I've really never found a satisfactory answer to it. Mm -hmm. He keeps saying throughout this section, you did this, you said this, you, 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 you. But that's it was the generation before that did these things, and it's always puzzled me why he didn't say, your fathers, your grandfathers did this, this, and this. That's just, interesting. I mean, all of this happened like almost 40 years before. Right. 
and he's talking to them like they are the ones that they did it. And maybe right. it's the translations that I'm reading, but that it just I not don't me. know. Rabbi Abner probably be the guy to answer yeah, that. That's, that's exactly the point. Moses is not accepted to the club of dictatorship. Right. He apply, but he will be rejected. Why? You don't fit. Look, before the war, what do all generals do, the fearers do? That's opportunity for their life. They take hold on the government. I am the fear. You stand in line. You are the salt on the earth. You listen to me only. There is no individual right. No individual right. Everything is belong to the state, to the army. Stand in line and keep quiet. No, no strike. All the train go on time. Germany was saved by, by Hitler at the beginning. He, he saved him from, 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 from the terrible economy and so on. We follow the fear. What does Moses say? He's the only general in the world ever. And he says, look, I cannot carry you. I, I, instead of, you say I'm so weak, I want to appoint other officers. Listen to them. Have you ever seen a general like that? <laughs> no. <laughs> and, and his soldiers are not, are not the Prussian soldiers. Uh -huh. Instead of saluting, they keep quarreling. I see what you're doing. And instead of uh, whatever, what, and, uh, again, instead of taking away the civil height, he must stand there, the Jewish general, the father of all prophets, okay, the man who brings the Shekhinah to the world. And he says to them, listen, even in this time of trouble, you need to listen to it. He says, the point of them, Judges that you know, and judges that will know each one of you, and they will respect the individual right. I mean, there is a whole line here of instruction to the judges. Right. You should not prefer one on the other. Correct. You should, see, you should not stand up. You know, there is a lot of logic. Right. Logic instruction to judges to respect the individual. At what point Moses says that? Before a major war, right? Has it ever been done in any other other army instead of the true army of God? Tell me. You understand the depth of it. As a matter of fact, dictatorship Rabbi, is 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 um, uh, is an abomination mm -hmm. to Moses. Taking away the the individual right is abomination. Right. Even in a time of war. Right. That's what he said to Joshua. And that's what he said to the Jewish people. He says to Joshua, listen to the to the judges. First of all, listen to the to, to the complaint of every individual. Right. I mean it's it's just the opposite right. of of what you expect from general. That's why I'm saying I know that Moses applied. To, to the club, to membership of the club. And he, he was rejected on the spot. Yeah. Stalin will not accept him. Right. Genghis Khan will not accept him. Alexander the Great and, and August Caesar will spit on him. Mm -hmm. Okay? But Moses, who is going to win? Who is going to be the final winner? Augustus, Caesar, the son of God? Mm -mm. Or Moses, the one who says, I cannot carry you. Who is going to win the battle in history? Who is going to lead mankind to the Messiah? Okay. Uh, I'm referring to the class that I'm going to be working now right. on, on, a, on a Torah, a Messiah, and a mystical Messiah. Both within Judaism, 
Right. I'm not talking about another religion. Right. I'm talking about honest approach for mystical Messiah and, and Torah Messiah within Judaism. That's going to be a great, a and great that's, that's uh, class. Yeah. But, uh, who's going to win the war? The final war. Moses kind of, or, or, or Sodom kind of. SS is, is not, SS is Sodom soldier, Sodom society. Okay. My eldest son, as you know, retired from the army and uh, he's back here in town. And he said to me the other day, he goes, he said, I, I know I've probably been acting weird since I got back home, maybe a little aloof. But he says, this is the first time in my life since I was 18 that I have been able to live in a society that is not governed by uniform code of military justice. It's a dictatorship. You, you don't have rights as a normal citizen. Like the rights that you and I have as an American citizen – you negate those rights when you join the military. You're on a completely different justice system. That's what Rabbi's talking about. Generals cannot command an army to do what they want them to do by saying, have respect for each other, make sure that you do the right thing. <laughs> you understand? It just sounds like, what? And, and the good question is, Rabbi, when you ask, well, who's going to win the battle? Because we think most of the time the battle goes to the to the more, most vicious, the most horrible, the most dictator. And in reality, God's going to win the battle for yeah. Israel. Yeah. It's coming. We're, we're, we're coming to that. God willing, we're going to come Amen. to that. We see Amen. God break the feathers and the chains uh, uh, against the nations in the world and Israel. God willing soon, because I'm not sure how much more Amen. the state of Israel can go through its struggles. May it be soon, God willing, may it be soon. Anybody have comments you want to add to that before we move on? Yes, Tar. Uh, uh, this might be simplistic, I don't know. Uh, what, what intrigues me is those 38, 39 years that we don't know anything about. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, there had to be Torah teaching going on, you know, uh, Moses teaching the, the elders, the elders teaching the people. Uh, but then at night when the when the, the teaching were over and they were inside your tent, these these children, you know, some of them were, you know, under just under 20 when they came out of, out of Egypt. So they knew a little bit of what happened. Right, right. But the the parents had to have been distraught. They had to have been uh disheartened that they weren't gonna get they knew they weren't gonna get to go into the the land. You know, and I'm sure they told stories, you mm -hmm. know, about what it was like in Egypt. And, you know, and they probably badmouthed what was going on in the wilderness. And so these kids growing up heard these stories. So even though they weren't part, so, so many of these that he's speaking to did not live in Egypt. They heard all about Egypt. Right. It, it was in them. So they so that's one reason he was having to admonish them and say you, you know, right. because it was in their brain, there was in their minds. Right. But uh, back to why he was given this, uh, there's two different I see two different things in just the uh, the blue collar form. Uh anybody <laughs> that's uh, an alcoholic, an addict, overeater, whatever, you go through a 12-step program. Step number four is do a personal inventory. Right. Really, that personal inventory stays with you for the rest of your life so you don't, so you remember what triggers you to do these things that you're not supposed to. So, you know, he's bringing out this stuff to just remind them, okay, this is what happened. This is what y'all did. On the other side, anybody that's played sports, you know, uh, the coach right before you take the field or take the court, man, he gives you this pep talk. This is what right. we're going to do. We've trained hard. We, you, why you have faith in you, you can do this and everything. Uh, even people who are just uh, is not, uh, you know, who are just singular, like like runners or swimmers or uh, my instance is uh, is uh, uh, anyway. 
uh, so there's two things going on there, you know, he, he's, uh, I'll just leave it at that. So that's no, no, I, I appreciate that. Thanks. I really do. Verse 23, uh, says that I approved of the plan. I want you to notice something. He says, I selected from among you 12 participants, one representative from each tribe. Do you notice something missing? Ramban points this out to say he did not praise them as being princes of their people, of their tribes, and their leaders of the children of Israel. For since they acted wickedly, he would not speak praise of the wicked individuals. He just named them 12 participants, one representing each tribe. If you just read that, you just think they were willy-nilly picked out of the group. You don't realize these were leaders of Israel that he sent over that highly disappointed the people of Israel. Interesting. Uh, who? Uh, where else do you want to pick up? Let's go because if we're not, we're gonna we're gonna run out of time before we run out of uh, chapter here. Um, let's scroll down. Um, I like this one also, verse 27. He says, you sought in your tents and said, it is out of hatred for us that Hashem brought us out of the land of Egypt. Doesn't that sound like a child that's mad at mom and dad for spanking them or disciplining them? You hate me. This is exactly what they were doing. It says to hand us over to the Amorites and wipe us out. They were already predicting they were going to be destroyed. And what kind of place... Are we going to, this is Moses speaking, our brothers have taken the heart out of us saying, we saw their people stronger and taller than we were, large cities with walls sky high and even the uh, Anakites. Interesting. So he's going over talking about what these men trolled up, reasons why they couldn't go. Um. Verse 34, and God heard your loud complaint and became angry and vowed not one of those involved, this evil generation shall see the good of the land. Now, was it only the men or was it the men and women above 20? Do y'all remember? It was, it was the men right. and... I get. I believe it's also the tribe of Levi. Those men were not involved in this. Correct. Correct. Very good. You get mentions down Joshua and Caleb, of course, their faithfulness, and that um, his descendants will I give the land on which he set foot because he remained loyal to God. Because of you, Hashem was increased, incensed with me, saying, you shall not enter the land. Isn't that interesting that he is saying that it is because of you that I can't go into the land? Moreover, your little ones who said would be carried off your children, who, who would be carried off your children who do not yet know good from bad, they shall enter to them will I give it and shall they shall possess it. Let's see, let's go on through. He goes through, he talks about the Amorites. Talks about going through Kaddish, Barnea. We march back into the wilderness by the way of the Sea of Reeds. And Hashem spoke to me and 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 to me and, and skirted the hill country of Seir a, a long time. And then he said to me, You have been skirting this hill country long enough. Now it's time to turn north. And charge the people. As followers, you will be passing through the territory of your kin, the descendants of Esau, who serve, who live in Seir, 
though they will be afraid of you, be very careful. These people ended up becoming pretty nasty people. Um, what food you eat, you shall obtain from them for money. Even the water you drink, you shall procure. So they were offering to pay for the water and the food to go through. It says, indeed, God has blessed you all, uh, blessed all of your, you, your undertakings. He has watched over you, your wanderings through the great wilderness. Your God has been in, been with you for these past 40 years. You've lacked nothing. We then moved away from our kin, the descendants of Esau, who live in Seir, away to the road of Arabah, away from Elat and uh, Izion Geber, and marched in the direction of the wilderness of Moab. Trying to see what else we have here. Kind of be across. There's just so much here to unpack. Anybody see anything that you want to directly to 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 deal with, Mike? Yeah, um, he gives uh, the Torah gives a pretty detailed history of a bunch of people that we don't know too much about: uh, the Korim, the Emin, the Raphim, the Zamzumin, and even a people called the Avim who were defeated by the Kaftorim. So why is all this history in here? And uh, again, Barbaral said that Moses reminded the people that the covenant that, Ab or that uh, Abraham had, that Moab, Esau, and Ammon would get their lands, and they, got, they inherited their lands, and all these people were great fighters, great warriors, but they were conquered. And the same is going to be true for the people of Israel, that they will come up against seven nations. But if God was faithful to Edom and Moab and Ammon, how much more faithful will God be to the children of Israel? Well, that's right. Con conquer the land. Even the little thing about the size of the bed was kind of curious. Right. But no, but it just showed that they were, these were some big people. These were giant right. big men, warriors and if they could be defeated how much more the children of god will defeat theirs so. right you know back in earlier years when i was younger and you know i'd hear discussions about israel and 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 bible prophecy and you would think you hear about the nations coming against israel all the nations gathering against israel and you would think that sounds harsh how in the world could the united states do that? How can England do that to Israel? Blah, blah, blah. And now we're living in a time right now where they're considering embargoing an arms embargo against Israel. Could you imagine? Th think about how ludicrous that is. Israel is attacked. They defend themselves. They go back to destroy the enemy. And now the world wants to disarm them. Uh, why not disarm Hezbollah? I don't like it doesn't make sense, but we realize that if if they could defeat uh, these armies, they could defeat this army. The problem is, is they're being hamstrung by people that are more concerned about the opinion of the nations than they are the opinion of God. Just find it quite interesting. Anybody else? Well, that's because they don't know the opinion of God. Correct. Yeah. Well, that's <laughs> you know, or they don't care. Yeah. Yeah. They're ignorant of the facts. Right. I don't know how to use my phone. Could I make a comment? Sorry to butt in without no, permission. No, go ahead. Go ahead. I don't know how to use my buttons on the cell phone. There have been some comments that Moshi was rebuking the princes of Israel. And although that may be true in Devarim, as I understand it, Devarim is written in the first person, which are the words directly from Moshe, mm -hmm. whereas the previous books are written in the third person because those words came from the creator, Hashem. Right. Mm -hmm. And in those four books, 
I did not get the impression at all that the creator was uh, admonishing the nation of Israel. It was the, the leaders. You are correct about that. Or even the, well, I'm a little out of my league here with you, sir, but the point I'm trying to make is the mere fact that Moshe uh, admonished the princes or had complaints does not mean that is not equivalent to saying that the creator was condemning Israel because this is Moshe's first person message, not, not a message necessarily from the creator. That's all. Okay, yeah, and Rabbi Abner sort of brought that up in the beginning. Rabbi, I think it was a beautiful remark. Uh huh. It was the, the the nature of the prophet and the nature of the Jewish people play here. And uh, Joe, thank you for your remark. Yeah, it's beautiful. It's a, it's a, that's why the Jewish people were elected because of this nature. Of, uh, I'm not going to be a dictator and you are not going to stand in line and you're going to respect. Look, have you seen, ever seen a nation that will release 1,000 prisoners with blood on their hand from Hezbollah and from Hamas for one soldier, Egal uh, Shalit? For one soldier. Israel released 1,000 accused and approved criminal for murder. Many of them returned to be murdered. Mm -hmm. Show me any, any other nation will do it. That's crazy. That's why Rashi says that it looks like <clears throat> both Moses and his people are crazy. Yeah. They are army of the Shekhinah. They are not army of, of, of the sword. Okay, so they are crazy in the, until today, right? Till today, that's interesting. But are, our army, our army is not. It's not. It's not like American army. No, it's not. Uh, I listen. I listen to the radio, and I listen to panels day and night. And they describe how uh, orders are issued, people salute, they turn around, nothing of that happens. That Israel army for the last 30 years mm -hmm. fallen apart because of its nature. Take care, Mary. Yeah. Okay. So the question is on the long run, who's gonna win? That's that is that is actually <clears throat> a good point to really consider because I've never really thought about it that way. Is to really understand that the uh the I like that comment, the army uh the army of Israel is an army of the Shekinah, not an army of the sword. Is that what you said? Yes. Yes. I, I said I it really a few like times. That. Yeah, that's I like exactly. That. That's why they elected. Right. And each, each, even though Israel was considered God's son, obviously, they're still individuals, and every individual was empowered to use their free will and choice to serve Hashem. Uh -huh. Incredible. Joe, did you have something you wanted to say? No. Oops. Okay. Oops. I, I, I want to uh, kind of sum up things. We've run out of time, and I'd like to sum it up with this thought. When, when God approached Moses, assigning him his life's mission, you remember this at the burning bush, it's to rescue the children of Israel. They had cried out to him and to take them from the bondage of Egypt. And he more specifically sending Moses to talk to Pharaoh, the ruler of Egypt, the, 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 the dictator of Egypt. Moses' response is this, oh my Lord, I am not an eloquent man, neither yesterday nor the day before nor since. Thou have spoken to your servant because I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. This man, in other words, had a difficult time speaking, maybe stuttering, who knows what it is. But he says he's not fit for the job. In the original Hebrew, 
saying I'm not an eloquent man is literally I am not a man of Devarim. I'm not a man of Devarim. What is the greatest legacy of Moses was left to human civilization as a messenger of God. Here's a man that says, I'm not a man of many words, of any words. And if I say them, I'm not going to be that eloquent to be able to speak them. But yet God chose him to be a mouthpiece. Once again, Rabbi brought up the fact that the Israel army is not a, 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 is a, is a army of Hashem or the Shekinah and not of the sword. Moses was picked precisely because he wasn't an eloquent man of beautiful speech that God speaking through him is going to be evident when they hear it. And it said in verse 20, verse 1 of Devarim, and God spoke all these words, Devarim. In other words, the biblical Hebrew for the Ten Commandments is Devarim. It's the words, it's the words. The last book of the Torah, the fifth book, is the most uh, is the book of Deuteronomy attributed to uh, the Jewish tradition is attributed to Moses himself. So the man of few words becomes a man whose words are still being read thirty five hundred years later. It's amazing. The message of God went through the most. unobvious person i guess it's like a convicted uh not a convicted felon but he was a uh, he was on the lamb running run from egypt killed a man yeah, i mean just think about this guy the least person that you would expect i would suspect that the days to come the age when mashiach comes god willing soon it's probably going to be somebody that you would not guess that would have be done that would be the guy Probably going to be somebody that you would think, wow, we all know this guy, but nah, really? It's the Messiah? We'll find it out soon, God willing. And hopefully through our faithfulness of study in Torah, that we will bring about um, a re rejuvenation of the nations and a trust in God like we haven't seen before. I'm afraid, though, we're going to have to get to a lower place before more people turn their heart to God. And may we see the salvation of Israel in our day, God willing. Anybody have any last comments or commentary before we go? Um, just a reminder tonight at seven, Rabbi Wolby's Thursday night class. Same yes. link. Also make sure to put it on uh, Facebook sometime this afternoon. Okay, guys, if that's it, uh, we're going to go for the day. I appreciate it. It's good to see all of you guys, Joe, Karen. Mike, Nathaniel, we'll holler at you later. Rabbi, we'll see you two Mondays from next Monday, or not this Monday, but the following. Thank you so much for coming to the class. Shalom, shalom, guys. Thank you so much.